And I don't know if you can see, just on the horizon there, there's kind of like uh, two little sticky out bits of rock. Well, over there to the right, just around that headland, a couple more sticky out bits of rock, and that's Mantabomi. We launched the boat from this beach. Once we're in the boat, it's five or 10 minutes to get to Mantabomi. This video is part three of my scuba diving adventure to dive with manta rays at Stradbroke Island just off the coast of southeast Queensland in Australia. I've combined the footage from dives three and four of that weekend into this one video and once again I'm buddied up with Chris and we get chased off by a horny loggerhead turtle, we get up close and personal with huge bull rays and we also see some afflicted porcupine fish. The surface conditions on that morning were totally different from the previous day. Nice and calm and flat. The huge electrical storm that had come through during the night had really cleared things out, at least on the surface. I was first in the water, closely followed by my dive buddy Chris. We headed to the anchor line and dropped down. Unfortunately, the storm hadn't done anything to clear up the visibility. It was pretty poor at the beginning of the dive, but it cleaned up later on. I think at the beginning, we were probably lucky to get three meters, maybe four meters of visibility. Chris and I headed straight to where the anchor was so we could orientate ourselves to the dive site. And we dropped into 10.6 meters of water, which is 34.7 feet. Our maximum depth on this dive site was 15.1 meters or 49.5 feet. There's no pun intended, but the first thing I spotted was a blue spotted ray. And this guy didn't seem at all skittish or scared of the diver. He came in close for a quick look at what I was doing with the camera. He's probably quite used to them on this dive site. Following him over to a sandy patch, I noticed this small school of juvenile squid swimming past. Very curious creatures. Because the visibility was so bad at the beginning of this dive, I was very glad that I'd brought my dive torch with me as I stuck my head into all sorts of cracks and crevices to see what creatures they would reveal. In this little hidey hole, the first thing I noticed was the antenna of the painted cray sticking out. But as I looked closer, I noticed a big wobbegong also hiding in there. You may notice the right fin of the Wobbegong just twitching slightly there. He was not feeling comfortable that I blocked his exit point. And I wasn't very comfortable being in the way of his exit point, so I decided to back off. A little further into the dive, we spotted another Wobbegong shark, this one out in the open, and I would guesstimate probably around about 1.5 meters in length. This one was not at all concerned about my presence and being so close filming. He probably had a good night of hunting and a belly full of goodness, so he was just casually sleeping it off. As well as the big fish and the small reef fish, there were lots of other marine creatures to see like these living fossils, the crinoids. And I promised my viewer, Ryply Gamer, that if I came across any, I'd film them for him. Hope you enjoy. Initially here, I was coming to film the black crinoid that you can see on the left. But as I got closer, I noticed there was a small porcupine fish in here who seemed quite sluggish and lethargic to me. As I looked closer, I noticed at the top of his head and just behind the eyes, there seemed to be some sort of worm or something like that that was burrowing into his head. Maybe that was making him feel pretty bad. Lots of fish have parasites, and some of them are symbiotic relations, which means both of the fish and the parasite will get something out of the relationship, and others, of course, are just detrimental to the host fish and advantageous to the parasite, sometimes leading to the death of the host fish. The next porcupine fish I spotted was almost like one of those macabre, dual-faced creations you see in a horror movie. As I've said previously, the porcupine fish is one of my favorite fish in the ocean because of their big, beautiful eyes and a big, beautiful mouth. But when this guy turned around and I saw the other side of his face, I could see that he was blind in one eye. You can see he also has some sort of small parasite on his back. 
as Chris and I got a bit more depth on this dive site, we came across this huge loggerhead turtle. It was easily the length of an adult's outstretched arms, and I couldn't even begin to estimate its weight. At first he paid no attention at all to us, and I was quite fortunate to be able to get up close with the camera. Now there were two things that I didn't know. Number one, this particular turtle lives here permanently and is known as the grumpy old bugger. Number two, we were just at the end of the turtle mating season. I'll just cut here to a conversation we had on the boat during the surface interval, which led to my enlightenment. That was better. That was better. A lot of fun on that one. Did you? Oh, the turtle. The big turtle. You got a turtle? Oh, the big one? Yeah. He's a grumpy old He's a bastard, yeah. Had we known this information prior to encountering this guy, things might have turned out differently. I indicated to my dive buddy Chris that I wanted to get a size comparison with him in shot with the turtle. However, as Chris got closer to the turtle, the surge knocked him backwards and I think his tank must have tapped onto the turtle's shell, which caused the grumpy old bugger to rise from his slumber and decide to show everyone who was boss around here. At first he goes after Chris. After all, Chris was the one who bumped into him. Chris makes the smart move of backing off completely while I stay there filming and of course Mr. Grumpy Turtle decides I'm the next target. I began gently finning away, but had to pick up the pace quite a bit as Mr. Grumpy started biting at the camera. You can hear my dive computer beeping madly at me, telling me that I'm ascending too quickly. Once Chris and I had stopped laughing into our regulators, we came across this brown banded bamboo shark, or it's more commonly called a grey carpet shark. They can grow up to 1.2 meters or 4 feet, and they're currently on the near threatened species list. They can also survive in low oxygen conditions by switching off non-essential brain functions, and this is an adaptation for hunting in tidal pools. They can actually survive for up to 12 hours out of water. Spotting a couple of juvenile linefish underneath an overhang, I came in for a closer view with the camera. This guy, however, wasn't having a bar of it and decided he was going to show me who's boss. And with his many venomous spines, I was quite willing to back off. This fish is about the size of an adult's forearm and I just wanted to show you how this guy feeds by feeling with his barbels through the surface and substrate of the ocean floor looking for food particles. Here you can see an adult with some juveniles. And it was while filming this that I spotted my first grey shape in the distance. Thinking it was a manta ray, I came a bit closer, only to find out that it was a huge bull ray. Now, Australian bull rays can be up to 1.2 meters or 4 feet wide, and up to 2.4 meters or 8 feet long from tip to tail. And they all use the same attack mechanism, regardless of size. And the mechanism is called a sting, which is located near the base of the tail, and it can be up to 20 centimeters or 8 inches long in a fully grown bull ray. The sting is essentially a sharp spine with serrated edges or barbs that face forward towards the body of the fish. And there's also a venom gland at the base of the spine. The venom will generally not kill a human, but it will cause extreme pain. However, human deaths have been recorded. Steve Irwin was, of course, the most notable. And deaths in human generally occur when the sting enters the chest or abdominal cavity. This bull ray was a little bit smaller than the first one we saw, but it was still a fair size. And because it was out in the open, I was able to get a good close-up shot of the sharp, stinging spine.
Still on the search for manta rays, I spotted another bull ray. This one was hiding down in what looked like a little cave. And again, armed with foreknowledge, I didn't want to block this bull ray's only escape route, so I edged off to the right hand side and made sure that I was covered by rocks, leaving him plenty of room to escape if he got the jitters. Now Chris, my dive buddy, was just behind me and saw me obviously filming something, but didn't quite see what it was. Just watch what happens as I move around the rocks. I get interested in this beautiful pipefish and we spin around 180 degrees and if you look through you can see Chris my dive buddy getting down into that crevice and then spotting the bull ray and getting out of there like a bat out of hell. Smart move Chris. Still waiting to spot a manta ray, this huge bull ray came swimming past and you'll notice the other divers also getting out of the way of it. Very majestic creatures. Even if you're just snorkeling, there's no reason why you can't have a decent dive torch with you because if you shine it into all sorts of nooks and crannies, you can come across creatures like this wonderful moray eel. Worldwide, there are approximately 200 species of moray eels and the morays are frequently thought of as particularly vicious or ill-tempered animals. However, the truth is totally different. They want to hide from humans in these crevices and they'd rather flee than fight and they only attack humans in self-defense. That being said, many a curious diver has lost a finger or a thumb while trying to pet or feed morays. Personally, I wouldn't do it. I like having two thumbs and eight fingers. Check out those awesomely dangerous looking teeth. As we got towards the end of the dive, finally the mantas showed up and we got some awesome footage. Here you can see several remora fish tagging along with the manta ray and they hang around hoping to catch some morsels of food. With pretty much everything on our list of things to spot ticked off, Chris indicated to me that he was down to 50 bar. So we decided to call it dive over and head to the surface. As you can see by the end of dive 2 and the morning wearing on, the viz was clearing up slightly. Finally on the surface and able to chat, Chris and I were sharing our different perspectives of the grumpy old turtle attack. He was in a very bad mood, I think so. He was not happy. No, he wasn't. <laughs> I'll include full details of both of these dives in the description down below, including dive time, max depth, water temperature, and all that sort of stuff. I have a feeling that I'll be back to Stradbroke Island to do some more diving in the future, no doubt with Ken, and hopefully with that famed 15 to 20 meters visibility that everybody talks about. Once the rest of our dive group surfaced and were safely back on the boat, it was time for the short trip back to the beach, where everyone was needed to lend a hand getting the boat back onto the trailer. There will be a part 4 video of this trip to Stradbroke Island, and I'll link to that at the end of this video. Well, that was good. Yeah, it was awesome. Great weekend. Yeah. Definitely worth coming to again. It'd be nice if the, uh, the fizz was better. Yeah, the fizz was pretty cool, wasn't it? Yeah. If you enjoyed this scuba diving adventure with Q and you'd like to see some more, please subscribe to the YouTube channel and leave a like on those videos you do like and leave any comments in the comment section. As soon as I see those, I'll get back to you. Thanks for watching and take it easy.
Shelter.